we have luxury, good <laughs> living. We are the seventh wealthiest country well, in I, Africa. I don't <laughs> think it's a surprise that Ghana is doing so well. I guess the the issues with the trickle down effect. I mean, you people, feel it in your pocket. Uh, well, <laughs> speak for yourself. <laughs> in so matters like this, it. you want to speak for yourself. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> Thanks very much indeed, Sandy, for the summaries tonight. Let's move on to uh, stories that are running uh, tonight. Cabinet has given the approval for state institutions to be moved from the national grid to solar power. The energy ministry says the move is to help reduce government's bills at the electricity company of Ghana. As of 2016, government's total debt owed the electricity company of Ghana amounted to 728 million Ghana CDs, forcing the country to issue a 7 to 10 year ESLA bond to service the energy sector debt. Despite this intervention, it appears government remains the biggest debtor to the electricity company of Ghana. The new move by government to migrate all public institutions onto solar power, according to the energy ministry, would reduce the burden on ECG. Even though there is no timeline and cost allocated to the project. Vice President Dr. Mahmoudou Baumia says feasibility studies are underway for the commencement of a project. So in this regard, um, I think the feasibility studies for the Jubilee House and House of Parliament are already underway and we want to move this um, to all MDAs, to hospitals, to schools, police stations and so on. We've got to move towards solar energy by government. Uh, as a matter of priority. The initiative, when implemented, will see the installation of solar panels at all state institutions across the country. Dr. Baumia is optimistic the move will reduce cost of operations on the ECG. Uh, as you all are aware, historically, government doesn't tend to pay its bills to the ECG, which has put the ECG in uh, many f uh, financial quandaries. Uh, and so we are making the simple decision that at the heart of, of you know, making sure that, that the energy sector is financially self-sufficient, government should really move more towards solar power so that we don't get burdened with, with, with more and more electricity bills that government finds difficulty in paying. Reku Edu is Deputy Energy Minister. Uh, yeah. He mentioned Flagstaff House and Parliament House. Um, the other institutions, you know, there's a rollout of this government policy to put a lot of the state-owned enterprises, state-owned uh, facilities, hospital schools and similar facilities on renewable energy. And you know, that's a smart one because if we take great power and we're unable to pay and you tap a renewable energy sources where you are independent of great power, then it means that government bill to ECG becomes managed rather than the growing bills, which the, uh, has become an issue of discussion almost every now and then. My, my final question would be whether we've uh, provided the funds for this project already. A funding I know is being secured. I know is being secured. I can talk about, uh, example, the parliament one, which I know it's in the process of uh, being secured, even though I can talk of one that is available but not sufficient. But because it is not sufficient, you know, you want to look for one that is appropriate for a project like that. All right, so you heard that the Deputy Energy Minister Joseph Kujo on moves by government to switch from uh, the national grid to solar energy. Joining us now via Skype is Ishmael Ajakum um with Kite for some analysis on this issue. Uh, thanks very much for your time, sir. Ishmael Ajakum Executive Director of Kite. Now, your thoughts generally about uh, this move by government to uh, switch from the national grid to use solar energy. How practical is that? Do you think we are there yet? Well, I, I think he, they've explained why it's not because they have a special preference for solar, but it's because they are unable to pay their bills. So let's look for something that after making the initial investment, you wouldn't have to worry about recurring expenditure. So I, I think it's a, it's a step in the right direction for two reasons. One is obviously you can't continue to be owing the utilities and two we'll be contributing to promoting renewable energy in this country so i think it's a right move 
it's the implementation that I believe will be the challenge. And I think you asked the, your reporter asked the minister a very salient question whether they've already found the money to do all of this. Uh, I, I think the challenge will be how to raise the funds to do all public buildings, which of, obviously includes schools, hospitals, and places like that. All right, and uh, so for now, we have no timelines, and I'm told that there is no cost to this project uh, yet, I mean, as you alluded to. Uh, help us understand, help our audience understand how cost-effective this uh, plan would be for government and in helping us you know, salvage our debts with the ECG. Well, the, in terms of its cost-effectiveness, it really depends on the kind of systems they're going to put at the public institutions. You know, uh, uh, thankfully, the price of solar, the cost of solar and install solar is coming down. But you still have to, if you want to take them completely off the grid, then you need to have storage. And the battery component, that is still quite expensive. So it's going to be cost effective uh, insofar as they are able to reduce their bills. but. I, I'm saying that we need to understand exactly what systems are going to be put in there because I, I don't think they can do solar, they can put solar to cover all the loads. For example, if you want to do air conditioning, you probably wouldn't even have space in parliament to be able to put the panels and the, and the battery banks, everything there. So I suspect that it's basically going to share the load between the grid, but 100% solar would require a lot of initial investment, even though it will pay for itself over the right. life of the of the investment. But mm -hmm. at, at the moment, I think we lack details to comment on its cost effectiveness. But ultimately, with all renewable energy technologies, the challenge is raising the initial investment. Once you do that, you are guaranteed of call it free power until you recover all the investment. Let, but we need to know exactly what system they are contemplating. For the schools, it's pretty much straightforward because the, most of the loads are lighting loads. But where you have air conditioners and things like that, you need to, we need to see all the feasibility study. It would be interesting to see the assessment yeah. done at the Jubilee, Jubilee House, for example, but it requires yeah. a lot of money to be able to switch over completely. Just, just a quick one uh, before we go. I'm told we have 30 seconds on this one. Uh, hooray, we found... <laughs> a solution to the ECG's financial problems. Is that the case? And bearing in mind that Morocco is taking over ECG hopefully next year. No, we, we, we cannot find all the problems. ECG's problems are, are, are too many to be resolved just by putting solar panels on, on the rooftop. But it's certainly going to prevent the piling up of public sector indebtedness to the, the, the distribution utility. All right. Thanks very much. Executive Director of Kite Ishmael Ejikum Hene uh, sharing his thoughts there on moves by government to switch to uh, solar energy, that is public institutions switching to solar energy. Let's move on to another story we are following for you. The U.S. is set to launch a $60 billion initiative dubbed the Better Utilization of Investments Leading to Development Build Act. This new investment strategy is a counteroffensive against China's growing investment in Africa. Meanwhile, President Kufuado has been defending government's business relations with China at the just-ended Financial Times Africa Summit in London. Take a listen. A bunch of Americans doing business in China. Are they getting involved in debt trap diplomacy? I don't understand why we're being singled out for this particular initiative. China is a very important part of the global economy. My understanding is that today it's the second economy of the world. How can Africa live in a world where we don't deal positively with the second economy of the world? We're dealing with them, and we will continue to deal with them. It is in our interest. All over the continent, the one economy that is seriously engaged with Africa in providing uh, an answer to our infrastructural deficit is the, are the Chinese. American companies, European companies are not coming forth to help us build our railways and our roads. Uh, the Chinese are coming forward to do so. We're supposed to turn around and, 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 and cast a baleful eye at them? No. We need their involvement in our economy. And I think that the presence 
of some 50 odd leaders from the continent in Beijing, who were barely a month ago at the FOCA, is a clear indication of the attitude of Africa towards China. We are back on Business Live. Let's do our big story for tonight. And coffee production was at its peak in the mid-60s. But as of 2016, the country produced virtually nothing, even though the commodity has the potential of raking billions of revenue for the nation. Little or no attention has been paid to the sector by successive governments. The closest we got to was lip services. Just last week, we had another promise by government, and government is saying that they have committed some 50 million cities towards coffee production. Is this another political talk? Edward Karawe is the General Secretary of the General Agricultural Workers Union, and he joins me in the studio. Thanks so much for your time. But before we do that, we actually want to look at um, uh, the state of Ghana's coffee production when it comes to statistics and where we stand. Let's do that, and then when we come back, we have the discussion. Well, all the coffees are settling in Brazil and not in Ghana. So we are back in the studio for the discussion. Thanks so much once again. As of 2016, Ghana produced virtually nothing. Why is it so? Well, let me say good evening to our colleagues who are watching. All right. The General Quattro Workers Union mm -hmm. and their farmers. The fact here is that uh, it has to do with uh, demand and supply. Mm -hmm. You know, when there's no demand, when there's global slump in the in demand, then of course uh, farmers will not see the need to grow the coffee. So there must be demand first, and when there's demand, that will drive production. So it tells you that in 2006, mm -hmm. 16, mm -hmm. there was virtually no demand, so there was no. Is it because for we farmers. have not produced enough to uh, actually even market? So it's not that there's demand. I mean, there's export for we can export for money. So are you talking about domestic demand or the demand on the international market? Well, domestic demand is very low. Okay. How many people take coffee in Ghana? Uh, our weather is hot uh, to start with, and then uh, there are also some certain perceptions about coffee mm. that it gives caffeine it has this it has gives high blood pressure whether it's true or not all those things also affect domestic consumption mm. um, and you trust me that most of the primary products we produce are mainly for the export mm -hmm. cocoa itself the local consumption is very low so uh, what about coffee then mm. so and again you should know that uh, the lands, farmers have a choice. Right. If they see that the price of cocoa is going up, why should they produce I was coming coffee? to that. I was, don't you think that we are over-dependent on cocoa when coffee actually can break in a lot? Let's talk about Brazil. They made about $5.4 billion as of 2016. Vietnam also got some $1.2 billion as of 2018. Mm -hmm. Ethiopia is actually the, the continent's largest producer. So are we not losing out? And how much are we actually losing out? Well, when you say we are losing out, it's just to say that we are not taking advantage of right. that. But, of course, we have been stuck to only one crop, that is cocoa. Mm -hmm. And then we, all these years, we've been depending on cocoa so much. Uh, in the past, the governments have tried to diversify the economy to oil palm, rubber, and so many other areas. But unfortunately, uh, diversification of coffee has not been successful. Uh, the statistics show that uh, we have not been able to do much 
uh, for a long time on coffee. It, right. So government is saying that they have committed some 50 million cities towards uh, the production of coffee. This is not the first time you're hearing this. We've had a lot of political talks from politicians, assessing government. How differently should we be um, treating the coffee production sector in Ghana? And the coming in of this money, how will it help change the game? Well, I cannot speak for government, right. but I can say that we only have to take the commitment as it is now. We hope that government will actually put, uh, make available these 50 million uh, cities, mm. and then it will also actually uh, use it for the purpose that it is intended. What will it take to change, to change uh, the coffee industry? How, what can we do to actually whip up interest in the first place and also get more people into the production of coffee? One, farmers must be assured that uh, it will not be a one day wonder, it will not be a nine day wonder. Mm. Uh, government will continue to support them to produce it. Mm -hmm. Just like today, we know that cocoa, once you go into cocoa production, you have a, a sustainable uh, input supply, mm. and then you also have a guaranteed market. Mm -hmm. So that has to be extended to the coffee farmer mm. to be assured that come the next five years, 10 years, once I go into it, I will continue to have market and I will continue to have my input supply uh, all right. uh, sustainable. Right. Before I let you go, one we even ask, we're talking about coffee and how much we can make from coffee, coffee actually, but is the climate that we have here, the regions, the, t the soil types that we have, is it conducive for coffee production? Coffee production is even um, cheaper than okay. producing cocoa mm. and then uh, it has a similar growing season like cocoa. It takes 18 months for uh, coffee to mature. Mm -hmm. When it comes to cocoa, you, when you start a cocoa farm, it takes three to four years. So you can see that it's even cheaper. Uh, time uh, gestation period is shorter. Mm. So it is just a question of uh, uh, making sure that we convince people to produce co uh, I mean coffee. Mm -hmm. We also convince them that they will have sustained inputs and their market uh, uh, supply. Once they have that, people will go into it. All right. Thank you very much. Edward Carraway is the General Secretary of the General Agricultural Workers Union. And we've been talking about coffee production and what Ghana stands when it comes to coffee production. You're going for a quick commercial break. When we come back, business like returns. <laughs> All right, interesting conversation on coffee production in Ghana. Do you take coffee? Uh, sometimes. I'm not a coffee person, but there's great potential. Right. I, I did a story about a lady who was doing the production here in Ghana, and she said there's great potential. So right. uh, let's take it seriously. Let's hope that government really um, commits that money and yes. we see that come to fruition. Mm -hmm. No play on words. <laughs> my name is Daryl Carl. Thanks for watching tonight. And my name is Sandra Isenamathami. For more news, do log on to myjoinline.com forward slash business. Thanks for watching.